Darwinian dogma says it is impossible to change our genes. But most of us looking at our parents would quite like to. <laughs> I know my kids particularly would. But how would you feel if someone were to change your genes for you without your permission? Let's find out. 1.3 million people every single year die of lung cancer. Most of these are related to smoking. And although rates have been decreasing uh, in Western world for many decades, particularly in men, in women, lung cancer rates continue to increase. And they're soon set to overtake breast cancer as the amazing major cause of death. Now, what's even more strange is that nowadays, if you take people with lung cancer diagnosed today, up to 20% of men and 50% of women have never smoked. Why? In the 1950s and 60s, nearly everyone smoked. Our grandparents' generation and these friendly doctors advising you which cigarettes to buy. And what we need to think is, is it possible that their bad habits back then could be affecting us now, even if we were never exposed to their bad habits, their cigarette smoke? And if that's true, could our bad habits today perhaps be affecting our future grandchildren? Now, for 20 years, I've been studying twins. And I've been trying to convince a rather skeptical world of the amazing power of the gene, the center of my universe. But my recent work has made me change my mind. I've changed research tack, got some grants, even wrote a book about how you can change your genes by switching, your, switching them on and off a bit like light switches. And I'm doing this with identical twins, who are the perfect model for studying this, because identical monozygotic twins are formed from a single egg. And that egg, at about three days old, splits into two individuals. Each of those has exactly the same genes, exactly the same DNA in every cell of their body. They are genetic clones of each other and there are a few of them here. Now, they have very similar environments, and it's not therefore surprising that when you look at them, they have the same, they look the same. They have the same smiles, the same expressions, the same laughter, which the media love. But if you scratch beneath that surface, you're often going to find more differences than similarities, particularly in personality and behavior. Now, most people, when they read these sort of headlines about twins who've died within a few hours of each other, think that this is very much the norm. But nothing could be further from the truth. The fact is, most twins die not within hours, not within months, often not within years. And they do not die of the same diseases. In fact, they don't even get the same diseases usually, even if those diseases are very strongly genetic and very common, like diabetes, heart disease, schizophrenia, arthritis, etc. So, how is it that these genetic clones with the same environments often end up so different? And it's this fact that made me change my gene centric view of the world. There used to just be two ways of describing any trait or personality or process, nature and nurture. And we now know that nurture can actually act on nature via our lifestyle and environment affecting our genes. And it does this via a process we call epigenetics, which just comes from the Greek word on or above the gene. And epigenetics is a simply a process by which you get chemical switches which can turn your genes on and off a bit like a light switch without altering the DNA structure, but those chemical switches 
will still be present in several generations. And amazing experiments have actually shown us that if our grandfathers smoked at an early age, we are more likely, they were more likely to produce grandchildren who were chubbier, shorter, and more prone to diabetes than if they hadn't smoked. And similar studies in rats have shown that if you're, you had a grandfather rat who smoked, the grandchild is more likely to be asthmatic, even if they've never come in contact with them and they've never had any cigarettes exposed. And this is due to epigenetics. Now, I got asthma as a kid, and I didn't smoke. Well, one or two, maybe. Um, but it's a bit of a worry that potentially my grandfather's habits might have, A, helped me get asthma, and more worryingly, might have be, made me more susceptible via my immune system and these epigenetic changes to future lung cancer. Now, other studies of a similar vein have looked at rodents who are deprived of their mother's normal licking and cuddling, which is the normal pattern that rodents grow up with. And when you deprive these animals of the normal maternal care, they are more likely to produce grandchildren that are more neurotic and antisocial. And this is by epigenetically altering their hormones, sort of lowering, if you like, their empathy. Now, this is partly reversible, so that if you put these, the offspring of these pups back with nice, cuddly mothers who give them lots of licks, you can reignite their empathy genes and get them back towards normality. So this perhaps is a, a useful model that we might be thinking about for our problem families and abused children, etc. So it looks as if the lives that our grandparents lived could very much be affecting not only our genes, but also our individual life courses. Now, coming closer to home, we are particularly susceptible to change when we're in our, our mother's womb. Our genes are sensitive to those epigenetic changes. And most women during pregnancy take lots of vitamins. And the number one vitamin most women take is folic acid, which is probably the most important epigenetic vitamin. And in small amounts, it's amazingly good at preventing things like birth defects like spina bifida. But we now know that if you take too much of it, and there's lots of it around, fortified in our foods, etc., you can get increased risk of cancer, infertility, and it can also affect brain. Now, if that's not worrying enough, what about those toxins and other things that we don't know we're taking? And these might come from substances such as plastics, which contain bisphenol or BPA, which is another powerful epigenetic agent. And animal studies have shown that these can affect epigenetically our hormone levels and also our neurochemicals in the brain. And this can, again, last several generations. Now, it's quite hard for us all to just escape plastics in our lives. Um, but we really should be trying to get rid of them. But the good news is that if there are any babies in the audience, you can now get bisphenol-free bottles. Um, so we should all pretend to be babies, I think. So um, who else can we blame for our differences? What about prehistoric bugs? Microbes have been with us for billions of years, and we've co-evolved with them. In fact, there's so many of them, particularly in our guts, that they outnumber our cells 10 to 1. And they have 100 times more genes. And what's interesting is, if you look at our genes, we share 37% of our genes with bacteria. They're very much a part of us. So, and we know this, they affect us epigenetically and it's crucial for our immune development. So far from being boring passengers sitting in the dark in our poo, these microbes are really 
playing an important role in our lives. Now, all of you have rather different microbes. We're not the same at all. You, for example, would share 40% only of your microbes with the person sitting next to you. Now, don't take my word for it, but try that after the break. Um, see if it's true, but the, the exact content, the contents of your microbes, the constituents, will determine whether you're more likely to be fat or thin, whether you're more likely to get diabetes or not, whether you're more likely to have allergies or not, get cancer or not, have high blood pressure, etc. And all these are increasing, as is diseases like autism. And these are all related, potentially, to these changes in our microflora that have happened in the last few decades. Because we're eating badly with less diverse diets, we're overusing massively antibiotics, which we shouldn't be, and we have this current obsession with cleanliness, trying to get rid of all bugs we see everywhere, although most of them are our friends. Some people are taking this into their own hands. They want to change their microbiomes instantly. And they're doing what we doctors technically call a poo transplant, <laughs> by which they take, um, they pick a donor. And you pick a donor by them being whether they're super healthy or uh, super sexy or whatever, and they get their, their sample, add some water, liquidize it, put it in a magic mix, and with the tubes, they put the contents down through their nose, into the stomach, or through their bottom. The choice is yours. And within a few days or weeks, these people are feeling much better, the new microbes have taken over the environment, and the results are spectacular. I can tell not everyone in the audience is completely convinced of this. <laughs> and maybe for the moment you might want to stick to yogurt. <laughs> Coming back to our lung cancer story, if you remember, we talked about the, the, the tumour, and we now know that tumours actually do their nasty work epigenetically. They do it by switching off our natural defence mechanism which is our cancer protective genes, which we've all got hundreds of. And this allows them to then spread and metastasize. Cigarette smoke also helps because it turns much of those same genes off. And as we've, as we've discussed, our ancestors will also have some of those signals doing the same thing even if you didn't smoke. Now, the only good news here is that this is reversible. These switches are not permanent. And there are now four drugs on the market that are help for leukemia, and they work epigenetically by reversing those cancerous changes. And what's exciting is, okay, it's great for those rare leukemias, but there's 40 other drugs in development now that are useful not only in cancer, but other kinds of diseases diverse as dementia and autism. So let's, we'll be seeing many more of these drugs in the future. Hopefully they're going to be commonplace. So I hope I've convinced you that by studying twins, particularly identical twins, you now know that genes are not our destiny. And if you need any further convincing, just look at CC the cat here and her carbon copy identical clone with the same genes and DNA in every cell in her body. Looks perfect, doesn't it? Except for, oh, the eyes are different and the fur color's different. So you, if you're like me, would also want your $50,000 back if you'd paid for that fantastic operation. But what can you do now before epigenetics drugs come on the market? Well, there are a few things you can do. We've heard about some of the benefits of exercise, but there are some epigenetic benefits of exercise that are just being realized. You can switch off your number one obesity gene, FTO. You can do that epigenetically, and maybe other genes. You can stop smoking, because within three months, most of those anti-cancer genes can be re-stimulated. A diverse 
improved diet with fruit and vegetable is good for a number of reasons. It gives you those epigenetic minerals that you need, like betaine and choline, but also the more diverse the diet, the more diverse your microbes are going to be, and they're going to help your immune system. Let's try and get rid of most of these wasted antibiotics we keep poisoning ourselves with until it, unless it's absolutely necessary, because they don't certainly help your, micro, your happy microbes. I want you to lick and cuddle any kids you have now or in the future as much as possible. Really important because you want to re-stimulate their empathy genes because when you're old, grumpy and incontinent, they're going to need them. <laughs> plastics, we've said we want to get rid of plastics out of our world, but there are other things as well and there's at least 40 other toxins in other products like paints and varnishes. One very good reason that I have now given up doing DIY. <laughs> and let's not forget willpower. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you are right. Willpower has a genetic basis, and it probably also has an epigenetic basis. So my advice is use it. Now, epigenetics is also unpredictable. Oops. And we all start from a certain point in life, and our environment and our lifestyle will change our genes, pulling us in all kinds of different life courses and directions. And this is illustrated in a way why identical twins, when faced with exactly the same stresses at the same point in time, will react often in different directions, unpredictably. It also be my way, and there's a major stress to a group of people, like, say, Romanian orphans, badly abused and neglected, ten years later, one-third of them will remain unscathed. So it looks as if nature has given us an amazing defense mechanism with which we can react to a stress in unpredictable ways, lasting several generations. And that seems a really good defense mechanism. So in conclusion, I hope I've shown you that by really understanding our unique individuality, we can start to define and alter our destinies and those of our grandchildren. And we can do this whilst, hopefully, still remaining identically different. Thank you.